Hello, this is the sections 3.1 and 3.2 lesson. Uh, in chapter 2 we introduced the idea of discrete random variables and discrete random variables have ranges that are either finite or countable. And in this chapter we're going to introduce the idea of continuous random variables. And many of the ideas related to continuous random variables are the same as for discrete variables. The only difference is that with continuous random variables we're going to integrate rather than add. Section 3.1 we're going to motivate some of the basic ideas of continuous random variables and in section 3.2 we're going to give formal definitions. Okay. So to motivate the ideas behind uh, continuous random variables let's consider this random experiment. Suppose we select an M&M candy and measure its mass. Let's let the random variable x denote the mass of the candy. Now x uh, could take on any value between 0 and some theoretical maximum value. So its range is not finite or countable. So x is continuous. So to better understand uh, this random variable x, suppose we go out and we observe 30 values of x by measuring the masses of 30 M&M candies. And we collect the data shown here in this table. So this table says that one candy weighed 0.76 grams, another candy weighed 0.82 grams, another candy weighed 0.85 grams, and so on and so forth. Okay. So to try to analyze this data to better understand uh, this random variable x, we're going to first construct what we call a relative frequency distribution. And this is going to be very similar to the relative frequency distribution that we calculated back in chapter 2 with just some slight differences. Uh, the idea here is that we're going to divide the overall range of data values into several subintervals or bins or classes. Uh, these three words all mean the same thing. We'll use either subinterval or bins. Uh, but other books and software use the, the term classes. And then we're going to count the frequency of each of those bins or subintervals. Now for this example we're going to use 10 bins. Uh, there's nothing magical about that number. It's just a nice number that we chose to use. We could use more or less, uh, but we're going to use 10 in this example. Okay, so the next thing is we're going to calculate the bin width. And this is done by taking the maximum data value uh, subtract the minimum data value and divide by the number of bins. So in this example the max is 0.94, the min is 0.76, divide by 10, and we're going to round that off to two decimal places, so 0 0.02. So next we're going to construct a table, and the first column of this table contains our different intervals or bins. Uh, the lower limit of the first interval is going to be a number a little bit less than our minimum data value. So we're going to start at 0.75. The upper limit of this interval is going to be the lower limit plus the bin width of 0.02. So this first interval goes from 0.75 up to 0.77. Notice that we include the right endpoint but exclude the left endpoint. Our next interval goes from 0.77 up to 0.79 and down the list. Next, we count the number of data values in each one of those bins. So we just look over our data, and we observe that there's exactly one data value between 0.75 and 0.77, including 0.77, but excluding 0.75. There's zero in this interval, there's two in this interval, and on down the table. And next, we calculate our relative frequencies, where we take each frequency and divide it by the total number of data values. Uh, which is 30. And so this table right here is called the relative frequency distribution of the data. Next we draw a picture of that relative frequency uh, distribution in the form of the relative frequency histogram. And this is very similar to the histograms that we drew back in chapter 2. Uh, the vertical axis is labeled relative frequency. On the horizontal axis we put our different values of x. And then for each one of our, uh, our bins or subintervals, we draw a vertical bar uh, with height equal to the relative frequency. Now the midpoint of that bar is the midpoint of the subinterval. So the midpoint of that first subinterval is 0.76. That's where our first bar goes. And so we have one vertical bar for each of our subintervals. And uh, so this is a picture of our relative frequency distribution.
Now remember that relative frequencies are approximations of probabilities. And so where the bars are tall, that means that x has a higher probability of taking on uh, values in, in, that, in that interval. So for instance here, we see that the tallest bar is right here, corresponding to the interval 0.85 to 0.87. And one of the shortest intervals is over here, uh, 0.93 up to 0.95. So from our relative frequency to histogram, we see the probability that x is between 0.85 and 0.875 is, uh, or 0.87, is much greater than the probability that x is between 0.93 and 0.95. Okay. Now exactly how big these, uh, these differences are, the difference between the two probabilities are, we can't tell exactly from the histogram because these are just approximations of these different probabilities. But we can see that this probability here is a lot bigger than this probability over here. Okay. Now, one problem with a histogram like this is that it makes it look like the random variable is discrete. It makes it look like x can only take on values of 0.76 or 0.8 or 0.82 or 0.84 or so on and so forth. And so to solve that problem, we're going to draw a smooth curve that kind of captures the shape of the tops of these bars, as shown here. So we've got this nice smooth curve that kind of goes close to the tops of all those different uh, vertical bars. That curve is what's called a density curve. The density curve is the graph of what we're going to call the probability density function, the PDF. Uh, the PDF is the continuous analogy of the discrete PMF. Now PDF and PMF are not exactly the same, uh, but they are very similar. And we're going to use them in similar ways. Similar, not identical. And so let's make an observation about this density curve. So I've already noted here that this probability is bigger than this probability here. Well now let's make an observation about this density curve. Okay. The area underneath the density curve between 0.85 and 0.875, or 87, that's this uh, area right here, is bigger than the area underneath the curve between 0.93 and 0.95. Okay. And uh, so this illustrates, uh, this uh, kind of motivates the basic ideas behind how we're going to use this EF. So the idea is that areas underneath the density curve are going to give us probabilities. Or in terms, of calculate, in terms of calculus, we're going to integrate the PDF to find probabilities. Okay. Now a description of the PDF is called a distribution or the distribution of x. Uh, back in chapter 2, we said that a distribution was a description of the PMF. Well, kind of the same idea here, only instead of describing the PMF, we're describing the PDF. In Chapter 2, a distribution could take the form of a graph, a table, or a formula. Here in this chapter, we're going to describe PDFs with either graphs or formulas. We're not going to use tables uh, because there's not a simply a discrete number of values of x. Okay, so we're going to see lots of graphs and lots of formulas in this chapter. So now our first definition from section 3.2 is a formal definition of a continuous random variable and the associated PDF. So a random variable is said to be continuous if there exists a function little f called the, the PDF, which is continuous for all but a finite number of points and satisfies the following three properties. Now these three properties here are very similar to those properties for a PMF. Uh, just with integration instead of uh, summation. So the first says that uh, the PDF is greater than or equal to zero for all x. Uh, second of all, says that the if we integrate the density function over all values of x, we should get one. The third is a property that tells us how we're going to use the PDF to calculate probabilities. It says the probability that x takes on values between a and b is equal to the integral of f over the interval from a to b. Now these three properties are illustrated here in this graph. So here what we have is, is the graph of a, uh, of, a, uh, of a density curve. This is the graph of a PDF. And uh, now not every density curve has to have this shape, but this is a very common shape that we're going to talk more about later on in this chapter.
So the first property says that this density curve has to be above the x-axis. Second says that the total area underneath that density curve has to be equal to 1. The third says that to find uh, the probability that x is between a and b, we simply find the area underneath the density curve between a and b. So again, areas underneath the density curve are going to give us probabilities. Now, likewise, in chapter 2, we defined the CDF, the cumulative distribution function, and we're going to define it similarly here. So the CDF is defined to be this. It's denoted capital F of x. It's the probability that capital X is less than or equal to little x, and it's defined to be the uh, integral of the density function, the PDF, from negative infinity up to x. Now, we to change the variable of integration here from x to t so that we don't confuse this uh, variable of integration with the upper limit of integration. So graphically, here's our density curve. The value of the uh, CDF is the area underneath the density curve to the left of x. Now, one important relationship between capital F and little f is that the derivative of capital F equals little f. And that's true simply by the second fundamental theorem of calculus. This is a relationship that we're going to use later on in this chapter. Okay. So to illustrate these ideas, let's look at this example. Um, suppose that x is a continuous random variable with range 1 to 2. So that means that x can only take on values between 1 and 2. And its PDF is given by this. So this is its PDF described by a formula in the terms of a piecewise defined function. So it's equal to 2x minus 1 for x between 1 and 2 and 0 elsewhere. So it's going to be very common to see PDFs that are non-zero over only a finite interval and then 0 everywhere else. So one of the first things we like to do with a PDF is to sketch its graph. So this graph is the, is the density curve. And the density curve tells us a lot about the random variable. First of all, remember that, uh, that um, areas underneath the density curve are going to give us probabilities. So like here for x close to 1, there's not a lot of area. That means there's not a large probability that x is going to take on values close to 1. However, for x close to 2, there's a lot of area. So that means there's going to be a higher probability that x takes on values close to 2. For x less than 1 or greater than 2, there is no area underneath the density curve. So that means the probability that x is less than 1 or greater than 2 is 0. Okay. Next thing we like to do is verify that the PDF satisfies the, the first and second properties of a PDF. So first of all, notice that just by definition, this um, and, and we can see from the graph here that the PDF is uh, always non-negative. It's always above the x-axis. So that satisfies the first property. Second property, we need to integrate the density function over all values of x. So negative infinity, positive infinity. But we really only need to integrate from 1 to 2 because that's the only interval over which the PDF is non-zero. So we integrate that using the fundamental theorem of calculus and we get an area of 1. So there it satisfies the second property. We could have also verified this geometrically by looking at the, the density curve. And we see that the only area underneath the curve is that area contained inside this triangle with base 1 and height of 2. So 1 half base times height is 1. Okay. Now also to illustrate the third property of the uh, uh, PDF, let's calculate the probability that x is between 1 and 1.25. Nothing magical about these numbers, just numbers that we arbitrarily chose. So the third property says that we need to integrate uh, the, um, the PDF over that interval from 1 to 1.25. Over that interval, the PDF looks like this, 2x minus 2. And we integrate that to get this very small probability of 0.0625. We see that that's very small because there's not a lot of area underneath the density curve between 1 and 1.25. Now lastly, uh, let's find a formula for the CDF. So find the CDF. We're going to integrate the density curve from negative infinity up to x. Okay. 
Okay. Now, if we choose x to be less than 1, we see that the area to the left of x is 0. And so for any x less than or equal to 1, capital F of x is 0. If we choose x greater than 2, then uh, the total area to the left of x is going to be the area of this triangle, which we know is 1. And so for any x greater than 2, capital F is equal to 1. Now, if we choose x between 1 and 2, the area to the left is going to be the area underneath uh, the small portion of this triangle. In terms of integrals, we're going to integrate from 1 to x. And then this is our density function in terms of t rather than x. And we integrate that using the fundamental theorem of calculus. And here we get a, uh, a formula for the CDF uh, for x between 1 and 2. Sketch a graph of this CDF. And we see that for x between 0 or less than 1, the value of CDF is 1. For x greater than 2, the value of the CDF is 1. And then for x between 1 and 2, the shape of the CDF has the shape of this um, uh, parabola described by this x squared minus 2x plus 1. So next, let's point out some important differences between a PMF for a discrete random variable and a PDF for a continuous random variable. Uh, for a discrete random variable, uh, we use the PMF to calculate the probability that x took on some particular value. So for instance, f of a, where a is some number, is by definition the probability that x equals a. Now if a is in the range of x, and this probability is positive, if a is not in the range, then this probability is 0. So we use the PMF to calculate the probability that, f, that x takes on some particular value. However, for a continuous random variable, if we tried to calculate the probability that x took on some particular value a, uh, in terms of intervals, that's the probability that x is between a and a. And so by property 3, to calculate this, we would um, integrate the PDF from a to a. And from calculus 1, we know that an integral where the lower and upper limits are the same is equal to 0. So this illustrates one important difference between a discontinuous random variable and a discrete random variable. In a continuous random variable, the probability that x takes on any one specific value is 0. Uh, that's not the case for, PM, for, a, for a discrete random variable. Discrete random variable, the probability that it takes on some particular value uh, can be greater than 0. Okay. Also illustrates that uh, for a PDF, a PDF in and of itself does not give a probability. Uh, in order to find a probability, we must integrate the PDF. I could plug in the number a to my PDF and get out a number, but that's not going to be the probability that x takes on that particular number. Probability that x takes on any one number for a continuous random variable is 0. So again, PMF and PDF are not exactly the same. They're very similar, but, but fundamentally different. Okay. Our next definition, uh, we're going to de define some different terms uh, that are all very similar between a continuous and discrete random variable. So if x is a continuous random variable with PDF f, the mean of the random variable x is denoted mu, or, or e of x. And to calculate that, we take x times f of x and integrate that over all possible values of x. The variance is denoted sigma squared, or var x. And that's defined to be the expected value of x minus mu squared. To calculate that, we take x minus mu squared times f of x and integrate over all possible values of x. Standard deviation, denoted sigma, is we take the square root of the variance. The moment generating function of x is denoted m of t, defined to be the expected value of e to the tx. We calculate that by taking e to the tx times f of x and integrating over all possible values of x. Uh, the expected value of a function of x is denoted um, e of, of u of x. And we take u of x times f of x and integrate over all possible values of x. So you see that uh, these terms are all very similar, all identical to what we used with discrete random variables.
Uh, their notations are the same. Their definitions are very similar. The only difference is that with continuous random variables we integrate, whereas with discrete random variables we add. So to illustrate this, uh, let's these definitions. Let's look back at this example, uh, this particular PDF. And uh, so first, let's calculate the mean. Calculate the mean. We take x times the PDF, and we integrate over all values of x. Again, we only need to integrate over the interval 1 to 2, because that's the only interval for which the PDF is non-zero. And then we can calculate that using the fundamental theorem of calculus to be 5 thirds. The variance, we take x minus mu, square it, times f of x, integrate over the interval from 1 to 2. Uh, again, we could integrate that out to be a, a 1 18th. Now, the moment generating function is a little bit more complicated to calculate. So by definition, we're going to take e to the tx times the PDF, integrate over the interval from 1 to 2. Now here the variable of integration is x, so that means we treat t as a constant. And uh, so um, evaluating, finding the antiderivative here is a little bit tricky. We may want to use integration by parts, but there's our antiderivative. Uh, we plug in our values of x, and here we get a formula for the uh, moment generating function. So this could be done by hand, or it could be done using uh, available software. Um, our last definition is another idea similar to something we talked about back in chapter 2, and that's the idea of a percentile. So x is a continuous random variable with PDF little f and CDF capital F, and p is a number between 0 and 1. The 100pth percentile is a value of x denoted pi sub p, such that p equals capital F of pi sub p. Now this definition is a little bit complicated because we're using this variable p or pi. Pi does not mean the number 3.14. Pi is just um, we're just using it as a symbol here to, to note a percentile. Okay. So the idea here is that um, f, so the idea is that the percentile is a value of x. It's a value of x such that capital F of that value is equal p. Now in terms of the CDF. Uh, it's the area um, the area underneath the, the density curve uh, to the left of the percentile is equal to, to p. And uh, now the 50th percentile corresponding to p equals 0.5 is given a special name called the median and is denoted m. And uh, then a, a similar um, idea is the mode, the mode of a random variable x is the value x for which the uh, the the, the PDF is maximized. In terms of the density curve, the mode is the location of the highest point on the density curve. Now there are three special percentiles that we like to point out, uh, we like to, uh, um, that we give special names to. They are the 25th, the 50th, and 75th percentiles called the first, second, and third quartiles or denoted P1, P2, and P3 or, uh, or or pi sub 0.25, pi sub 0.5, and pi sub 0.75. So to illustrate how to calculate a uh, percentile, uh, let's look back at uh, this PDF, which we've seen before, and we calculated that the CDF is, is x squared minus 2x plus 1 for x between 1 and 2. And uh, so let's find the 25th percentile, P1. And so by definition, the 25th percentile is a number such that a capital F at that number is equal to P, which is 0.25. Okay. So now capital F at pi sub 0.25 is equal to this. We simply replaced x with pi sub 0.25. And so now what we have here is a quadratic equation. Our unknown here is pi sub 0.25. Uh, think of that as like an x. So we have an x squared minus 2x plus 1. And so we've got an ax squared plus bx plus c. Uh, if we subtract 0.25 from both sides, then we have it equal to 0. And we can use our quadratic formula to find a, um, the value of pi sub 0.25, which comes out to be 1.5. Or we could use available software to also calculate that value.